there's nothing, there's nothing as powerful as a story, as a testimony. And Abraham is a uh, dynamic young man in our community. He's attended our young adults ministry a, a few times. And uh, God is really using him and using his voice. And what an amazing story. Uh, all of us, all of us should be for life because this is not a political issue. This is a beating heart that we're talking about. This is an issue of a child that deserves the opportunity to have that opportunity to live their life. And so I want to encourage you, if you haven't already voted, early voting ends Tuesday. So when you go to Market Street to pick up your milk and cheese and eggs, uh, cast your vote. Uh, do your part. And if all the fine citizens of Lubbock will come together, those of us that are concerned for life, uh, we can move this topic in the right direction for God's glory. And friend, we do not see this as a political issue. I guess there are some issues that you could identify as political. Uh, once again, this is an issue of life. And we can all be thankful here at church today because our mothers chose life and gave us that opportunity. Amen. My series, Faith During Faithless Times, part three. We've got this week, next week, and then we're going to wrap up this small mini-series. And I've entitled the message, Victory Through Intensity. Uh, we're studying out of Second Kings in this series. And the big idea for today's message is, uh, I believe the two great sins, twin evils of the church today, are apathy and passivity. Because I believe in life that you don't rise to the level of your opportunity. In life, you rise to the level of your intensity that meets and matches that opportunity. We're going to be studying from 2 Kings chapter 13. We'll be reading out of God's Word. So out of love, respect, and esteem for the reading of God's Word, please stand to your feet. And here is the Word of the Lord. Elisha had become sick with the illness which he would then die. Then Joash, the king of Israel, came down to him and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and their horsemen. And Elisha said to him, Take a bow and some arrows. So he took himself a bow and some arrows. And then he said to the king of Israel, Put your hand on the bow. So he put his hand on it. And Elisha put his hands on the king's hands. And he said, Open the east window. And he opened it. Then Elisha said, Shoot. And he shot. And he said, the arrow of the Lord's deliverance and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for you must strike the Syrians at Aphek till you have destroyed them. And then he said, Take the arrows. So he took them. And he said to the king of Israel, Strike the ground. So he struck three times and stopped. And the man of God was angry with him and said, You should have struck five or six times. Then you would have struck Syria till you had destroyed it. But now you will strike Syria only three times. Then Elisha died, and they buried him, and the raiding bands from Moab invaded the land in the spring of the year. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this story that happened thousands of years ago. What it meant then, but what it means today in our own lives, in our own city, community, in our own churches. Lord, I pray that we would have ears to hear and hearts to receive what the Holy Spirit is saying through this section of Scripture. Speak to us, for your servant listens. We ask this now in Jesus' name, our Lord and Savior. And everyone said, Amen. you may be seated. Amen. This is the final request of a dying prophet, one of the greatest prophets in the Old Testament, Elisha, who God, through him, performed 28 notable miracles through the lifespan of Elisha, approximately twice as many as that of Elijah, his mentor. And here he is, the guy that could work miracles, yet he himself is on a sickbed, dying of an illness, is about to die. And the king, the king of Israel at that time, King Joash, he comes to visit him. He says, uh, my father, my father, the, the chariots uh, uh, of, of heaven and the horsemen. Same kind of reference to when Elijah was taken uh, supernaturally by God. The, the king is inferring, so heaven will be ushering you into your eternal reward. This was a kind and honorable act for the king of Israel to come to the deathbed of this great prophet, Elisha. And Elisha has one request. 
He tells them that there is a window that needs to be opened, and I call that the window of opportunity. And he wanted the king to take an arrow and to shoot the arrow through that window of opportunity before that window would be shut. You know, that really is symbolic to our, all of our lives. That there are moments and times in our life when a window of opportunity is opened by God, supernaturally. And we have to do something while that window is open because eventually that window will shut. Windows or doors of opportunity do not stay open indefinitely. Take your life, for example, and the time segments of your life. In Psalm 90, uh, Moses wrote that psalm, and, and he said, Psalm 92, he said, Lord, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. The importance of understanding that we are on borrowed time, and all of us have limited time in this life. If you live to be 80, we have a graph that we want to show you, and there's a jar, and there are beads in the jar that represent your life. Take, for example, your life in different time segments. You'll spend, get this, 33 years or 12,045 days of your entire life in bed, sleeping. So, you know, don't invest in a nice house. Invest in a nice bed. You sleep in the house but not on the house. You sleep on that bed, and it better be a comfortable one because you're going to spend 33 years of your life in it. And then when it comes to work, well, we work for out of 70, 80 years of living, 13 years and two months, 4,821 days spent working. So you should always be doing something that you believe in, something that you love, something that you value. Sleep and work for God's glory because basically that's your life. And then we spend 11 years, four months, or 4,127 days screen time. I think we could take back a big chunk of our life if we limit that screen time. Can I get a witness in the house of God, right? And then we spend four years, six months, or 1,583 days eating. That's why I'm a fast eater. Let's sit down to eat. Let's do our thing. Let's get going. No time to waste. And then for those of us that are married, I didn't know this. I want to challenge this. We spend one year and 30 days in romance. You know what that means, those of you that are married. That's 395 days. That's not enough. But anyway, moving right along. <clears throat> Vacations, exercise, social, school. If you live to be 80, you'll spend 334 days in school, both primary and secondary school. We think we're spending our entire life. We think it's forever. It's only 334 days. So what's left after it's all said and done? Eight years, two months, 2,997 days to live your life according to God's plan. So get busy. The window is shutting. And Elisha understands this. His window is about to shut. His time in this life is about to expire. King Joash, you have an assignment from God. The enemy is approaching. The enemy is coming. And we can all understand that in life. The enemy is coming. Matter of fact, Jesus said in John 10, 10, the thief comes, the thief comes, the thief comes, and he keeps coming and coming to steal, kill, and destroy. So you must put on the whole armor of God so that you could stand against the strategies and the wiles of the enemy. You must be sober and vigilant because your adversary, the devil, is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. So the enemy's coming. Be prepared when the enemy does arrive. I love what Sun Tzu said in The Art of War, that famous thousands-of-year-old book. He said, don't depend on the enemy not coming. Depend rather on being ready for him when he does come. So the enemy is coming. What enemy? It could be the enemy of fear. Or it could be the enemy of sickness, or loneliness, or depression, or poverty, or bullies, or whatever it might be. But the enemy is coming, both at your life, my life, our family, our marriage, our church, our city, our community, our nation, and the world. We're always facing some kind of a battle. But God is for you and not against you, and God gives us the opportunity for victory. He hands us the bow and the arrow. He says, open the east window and shoot the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. And when we shoot the arrow of the Lord's deliverance, I love the picture here in the Scriptures that Elisha places his hands over the king's hands. It wasn't the king by himself that was going to pull back the bow and shoot the arrow, but it was the prophet who also placed his hands over the hands of the king. It's as though God places his hands over your hands. It's not just the hand of God. It's not just the hand of man. It's not you facing the battles of life alone. It's you and I facing the battles of life with God. God is with us. God is for us. And God goes before us. And you can pull back that bow and arrow and shoot the arrow of the Lord's deliverance. 
out the window of opportunity. It's not just the sovereignty of God. It's also the responsibility of man. It's not just the responsibility of man, but it's the providence of God working together. Listen, we can make a difference if all of us will do our part and vote for life. God's not going to vote for you, but you and I could vote for life. We have our part in this. We're to take those arrows. And then Elisha says, take the remaining arrows and strike the ground. So King Joash, he takes the arrows and he taps the ground three times. La-dee-da, tap, tap, tap. And Elisha loses his mind. Elisha goes berserk. He blows a gasket. He said, what did you just do? Why did you stop? You know, Joash is like, what, what, what? You? The sin of apathy, the sin of passivity. Why weren't you more intense? Why weren't you more committed? Why wasn't there more consistency? Why didn't you smite those arrows five or six times? Then you would have completely annihilated the enemy. But now, because you only struck three times, now you're only going to have a partial victory. You know, in life, God wants us to have a complete victory. We must get to the place as a church, as individuals, where we're tired of half measures, half victories. We want all that God has for us. And sometimes we feel as though it's up to God, and God is saying, no, it's up to you. Strike the arrows and go the extra mile. Like Jesus said, if they compel you to go one mile, go two miles. If they compel you to go two miles, go three miles. Don't be the person in life that does just enough to get by. Always give a little bit more. If your job requires you to work 40 hours a week, then work at least 41, 42, 44, 45. Give a little extra. Don't be average. America is filled with average people. The world is filled with average people. God has called you to go the extra mile. God has called you to take the arrows of opportunity and strike the ground and just don't tap three times. Keep going, hallelujah, until you get the entire victory God has for you. We have to smite and keep on smiting our evil passions, our besetting sins, until they are destroyed. And sometimes it doesn't happen in a day or a week or a month. It might take several years. But friend, don't give up. The arrows of the Lord's deliverance are in your hand. Keep striking the ground until God gives you the complete victory. That's the attitude. You know, the Apostle Paul, basically his writings can be summed up in three statements. Play to win, run to win, fight to win. It's amazing how he used uh, athletic metaphors and, and, and warfare metaphors to describe the Christian life. Because we're, to, we're in a race, and he said, you're to run the race to win it. We don't always win it. Sometimes we lose battles, but ultimately we'll win the war. But we fight and we race as though we want to win, as though we're, that we're competing for the prize. If we fall short, well, we gave our very best. That's all God expects from us is for, eat, for each of us to give our very best. Take the arrows that God's given you and strike the ground, and don't stop at three. Go five, six, go to ten. Hallelujah. Come on, let's thank God for being ten times Christians. Because one of the scariest verses in the Bible, one of the scariest verses in the Bible is Psalm 78, 41. Let's read this out loud together. Yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Imagine that. Imagine that the children of Israel tied the hands of God. God is unlimited, and yet we can limit God. Think of that. We can, our, through our apathy and our passivity, we can limit God. In Mark's Gospel, chapter 6, Jesus went to his hometown. And in verse 5 of Mark, chapter 6, it says he could do. It didn't say he wouldn't do. It said he couldn't do. It didn't say he wouldn't do. It said he couldn't do many mighty works there because of their unbelief. So he simply laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. God in human form, Jesus in his own hometown, because they took him for granted, they became familiar with him. They saw him only as a good man or a prophet, but not as the Son of God, as God in human form. He wanted to do more, but he couldn't because of their unbelief. What more might God want to do through your life or my life? But we're limiting God. Why? Because we're only striking three times when we should go to five, six, or beyond. So what are the three arrows that God is giving you in this message and God's giving me in this message? Here are the three arrows, the arrows of intensity, consistency, and commitment. Let's look at the first one, the arrow of intensity. 
God, through this message, as Elisha said to Joash, take the arrows. He's saying to you today, take the arrow of intensity. In 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 2, Paul said, so proclaim the message with, say that next word with me. Say it again. Whatever you do, you and I should do with intensity. As I talked about last weekend, with fervor, with zeal for the Lord. What was King Joash thinking? Seriously, Joash, what were you thinking? What possessed you? Why didn't you carpe diem? Why didn't you seize the day, seize the moment? Victory was in your grasp, not for you, but for the nation of Israel. You could have totally annihilated the enemy, but now you were only going to have a partial victory because of your lack of intensity. Listen, it wasn't God who failed Israel. It was Israel through their king, Joash, that failed God. You know, in life, it's never God failing you, but there are plenty of times when we fail God. And as Paul said, even though we're faithless, aren't you thankful God remains faithful? Let's thank God that he's always faithful. That's why I struggle. I heard just the other day on Christian radio, somebody was saying, let us know your prayer requests. And we know sometimes you're mad at God. I've been walking with the Lord over 40 years. I've never been mad at God. I've been mad at myself. I've been mad at our government. I've been mad at my wife. I've been mad at my kids. I've been mad at my dog before. I've been mad at the church from time to time, but I've never been mad at God. How can we ever be mad at God? How can we ever be angry with God? I understand sometimes things happen in life, and sometimes we feel as though it's God's fault, but how many know that God is perfect love and God is perfect goodness? And if there's a problem, it's never on God's end. God's never the cause of the problem. He's the solution to the problem. So we got to get over being mad at God or being angry with God. Thankfully, God's a, God's a big God, and he could handle any emotion that we direct his way. But friend, at the end of the day, God is not your problem. Jesus is the answer. And if God is for you, who could be against you? When I think of intensity, I think of Elijah, the mentor to Elisha. You know, this morning, uh, how many of you got up and you turned on the water to your sink or shower? You turned it on. How many turned it on? Tell me you brush your teeth at least. Okay, thank you. And then you turned it off, right? And when you turn it on, the water flows. And when you turn it off, it it stops. There was a guy in the Old Testament, Elijah. He turned the faucet of heaven off, and then he turned it back on again. He said, it shall not rain. And guess what? For three and a half years, it didn't rain. And then he prayed again. He said, it shall begin to rain. And guess what? It started to rain three and a half years later. And when James, the half-brother of Jesus in James 5, 16, 17, 18, talks about this story, he said, Elijah was a man of like passions. In other words, Elijah's like all of us in here. We have our struggles. We have our good days and our bad days. We all have something that we are battling and working through and dealing. No one is perfect in here. I don't see a single halo in here this morning. Amen? So we can relate to Elijah. He was a man of like passions, a nature like ours. And yet, he prayed that it would not rain, and it didn't rain. Then he prayed that it wouldn't did. Why? What was the secret? The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much, is what James said. It's because Elijah was God's man, praying according to God's will, and he prayed with fervency. He prayed with intensity. He prayed with passion. He prayed with all his heart, with all his soul. Matter of fact, Elijah prayed with such intensity the, the word that is used, the Hebrew idiom for the word that is used of how he prayed that it would rain, is it actually it says he prayed with prayer. I don't know how you pray with prayer, but his prayer had a prayer to it. That, when your prayer has a prayer to it, that's intensity. That's being fervent in prayer. And we need to be intense. Ian Bounds, how can you talk about prayer without quoting the great saint of prayer himself, Ian Bounds. If you've never read any of his quotes or any of his books, do yourself a favor, download some some books on E.M. Bounds. He said this, importunity is made up of intensity, perseverance, patience, and persistence. There's something about intensity that gets the job done. I'll say that again. There's something about intensity that gets the job done. Uh, the other night, I was uh, walking my son's dog, Nyla. You know, she's an Australian shepherd, a year and a half. She's a medium-sized dog, pretty little dog. So we're walking. She has a, I have a chest harness on her. 
And uh, we're walking, it's dark. I like walking, you know, like it's 10 o'clock at night because like nobody else is in our neighborhood. And, and I got a big flashlight, you know, so I'm walking. And, and all of a sudden, this is kind of unusual for our neighborhood, two mangy dogs, like stray looking ugly dogs. They, she noticed them before I did. And she starts growling and barking, you know, and trying to go after them. And then they're coming towards us, these two mangy looking dogs. So uh, I have to think fast, right? So I shine my flash, flash, flashlight on them, right in their eyes, blinding them. Like, this is a bright flashlight, especially when it's dark out. And I could see their eyes. They were illuminating like red demon eyes. <laughs> These are like demon dogs. And uh, I stomped my foot and I said, stop. And guess what? They stopped. <laughs> I'm like, hey, it worked. Intensity, right? Now, I was glad they stopped because I did not want this to escalate. I, I brought a couple of friends with me that night on that walk, Smith and Wesson, and I didn't want to have to go there. <laughs> <laughs> so it ended well. So number one, we need intensity. Number two, we need consistency. The arrows that God's placing in our hands, because the window is open, but it's closing. The opportunity, the enemy's coming, and God wants you to have not a partial victory, but a complete victory. Number one, you need intensity. Number two, you need consistency. Say that with me, consistency. Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, therefore produce fruit consistent with repentance. Consistency. Those of you that are athletes, you know the importance of being committed and being consistent with your practices, with your, with your routine, with your exercise, and being intense, bringing a, a certain level of intensity. That's what sets you apart. That's what allows you to achieve your athletic goals. Consistency in all of life, though, is important. So what is consistency? It's when you match your beliefs with your actions. That's, that's consistency, where your beliefs and your actions collide, and they meet together. If you believe exercise is essential to good health, you're going to be consistent in whatever preferred method of exercise is you've adopted, whether it's going to the gym or walking 15 minutes a day, 30 minutes a day. You're going to have a level of consistency to match what you believe. Consistency is like the continual dripping of the water on the rock. Eventually, it's going to wear down the rock. And it's not what you do one and done. It's what you do consistently, consistently over a long period of time. Chuck Swindoll, you know, the great Chuck Swindoll, he has a great quote on consistency. It says this, it's the jewel worth wearing, the anchor worth weighing, the thread worth weaving. It's the battle worth winning. And how are those battles won? Through intensity, but also consistency. Those of you that understand finances and work investments or even have investments, you know it's better to make 5% interest per year in your, on your financial investments over the rest of your life than 50% interest in one year. It's what you do, it's what happens consistently, as small as it may seem, over a long period of time that makes the difference. You see, when it comes to you wanting to change your behavior, change your life, change your identity, change the outcomes in your life, it begins small, you start small, and it can grow big, but you have to be consistent in the small things. Listen to this quote I'm about to share with you. Before Socrates and before Plato, there was this guy, before all those guys, a Greek philosopher named Heraclitus. And he, he said many wise things, this Greek philosopher. One thing, one of the wisest things ever written down in the history of humanity was when he said this, character is destiny, or, character, or habit is fate or character is fate. And the reason it takes several English words, uh, because one Greek word, it takes about five to six English words to properly interpret one Greek word. So when he said these three words in Greek, basically they're translated character is destiny, habit is fate. It was profound. You see, your habits don't come out of your identity, the way you see yourself, the way you see God, your identity. Your identity comes out of your habits. If you want to change your identity, if you want to change something about your life, stop certain habits and start certain habits. And when you start certain habits over a consistent period of time, habit is your fate. Habit is your key to your destiny. So number one, it takes the arrow of intensity. Number two, it takes the arrow of consistency. And it's striking the arrow of intensity and the arrow of consistency along with the third important arrow that God gives us for our deliverance, for our victory. And that's the arrow of commitment. 
Everybody say that word with me, commitment. Look at Psalm 37, 5. Let's read it out loud together. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him, and he will help you. Keep that verse up for a moment. Commit everything. Say that with me. Commit everything. That means everything. Commit everything to the Lord, and then trust him, and then what will happen? He'll help you. And here's, here's how we would like it to have read. Lord, prove to me that you're going to help me, and then I'll commit everything to you, and then I'll trust you. It doesn't work that way. Now, sometimes it does, because sometimes God puts up with our foolishness. I'm reading through the book of Judges and Gideon. God called Gideon to deliver his people from the Midianites, and he says, I need to make sure that you're talking to me. Well, like an angel is talking to you. That's proof enough for me. I don't know about you. He said, okay, God, to make sure that you're going to help me, you're going to give me the victory, I want the ground to be wet and this fleece, this, you know, sheep's uh, uh, cloth, I want this, look, my watch is coming off. Uh, You know you're preaching when your watch comes off. So that's bad for you. That means I'm going to go over. He said, "I I want the ground to be wet and the fleece to be dry. And then it was. Then the next day he wanted the fleece to be dry and the ground to be wet. I don't know which came first, but it was, it was that, okay? And that was proof to Gideon, okay, the Lord, you're talking to me. Now I will, I will commit everything to you. Now I will trust you. It doesn't work that way. You and I have to be willing. It takes faith to commit everything to the Lord and then to trust him and to know that God is on your side and that God is going to help you. But we have to commit. We have to be all in. No turning back. <laughs> Hernan Cortez, the great Spanish conqueror, when he and his 500 men landed on the eastern coast of Mexico, you know what he did? He didn't burn his ships. He actually sunk his ships. And uh, he tried to fake out his men. He tried to say that, uh, you know, some insect, some worm ate through the hole and the ship sunk. And then they found out he was lying to them. And they wanted to kill him. And he said, but you don't want to do that. You know what the Aztec warriors do with their enemies after they kill them? They skin them and then they wear their, their skin as clothing. They said it would be a, he said, it would be a really bad idea. I'm the only one that can lead you into victory. They said, we think you're right. We're going to let you live. Smart decision, right? There was one ship left. He said, those of you that are afraid can get on that ship and go back to Cuba and then back to Spain, back to your family. But those that want the gold and the glory for God and king, stay with me and fight with me. Well, you know what happened? History tells us they defeated the Aztecs, right? Because they didn't have a backup plan. When they landed on the shores and the ships were sunk, guess what? They were in it to win it or they were going to die trying. You and I have to be committed. When we arrive on the shores of discipleship, of following Christ, there is no plan B. Jesus said, when you put your hand to the plow, don't look back. Hallelujah. you got to be committed. You've got to be all in. And then you'll see the hand of God. Then you'll see not a partial victory, a total, complete victory. You see, in life, you got to be fully committed. In marriage, you got to be fully committed. In your schooling, in your health, in your career, in church life, and serving God, and reaching your dreams and goals at God's place, you've got to be committed. And what is commitment? Here's one of the best, best definitions I've, I've ever come across. Commitment, commitment is willing to be unhappy for a while. How do you know you're committed in your marriage? Because you're going to have some unhappy moments along the way. Days, weeks, maybe months. But that's all right. You're what? You're, say it with me. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> King Joash is in church today. That was your arrow of deliverance. Committed. Yeah, you really convinced me. Do you think you deserve a second chance? In life, you have to be what? Committed. In marriage, you have to be what? Committed. In serving God, you have to be what? you got to be all in. you got to sink the ships. You can't have a plan B to go back to Egypt, or else you'll find a way to go back to Egypt. You all know the, the story. It's a cute story. The chicken and the pig, they're walking one day, and, and, the, and they, they saw, the chicken saw that there were some young children that looked like they hadn't had a good hearty meal in a long time, and he felt sorry for them. So the chicken told the pig, he said, hey, let's give them a breakfast that they'll never forget. Let's give them the best breakfast of ham and eggs. Well, the pig thought for a moment. And the pig said to the chicken, he said, for you, that's a small inconvenience. For me, it's total commitment. <laughs> right? We need to be totally committed. The acorn becomes an oak automatically based on the laws of nature and nature's God. A puppy becomes a dog based on instinct and biology and just natural growth. But humans, we only reach our full potential by our commitments. 
by our choices over a period of time that we do consistently and that we do with intensity. It's about commitment. You know, uh, we were having a business lunch this past week. We were at the Cast Iron Grill, and uh, we had a consultant from Dallas that came in, great guy, sharp guy, smart guy, and talking about some things for our school. And uh, we ordered, uh, we talked, we ate, we finished. Uh, the, the server came, you know, to say, is everything good, need anything else? And, and they were going to collect our plates. And she looked to the consultant from Dallas. He's a fairly young guy, and he's in pretty good shape. And she said, are you finished? And I looked at his plate. I'd never seen this in my life. 58 years old, I've never seen this before. A man that only ate half his cheeseburger. She goes, are you finished with that? He said, yes. I thought, that's a sin. <laughs> no man, no real man will ever leave half a cheeseburger on his plate. I was shocked. I said, you're not going to finish that? He said, no. And she looked bizarre herself. She said, do you want me to box it up for you? He said, no. Well, he was catching a flight, so I can excuse him on that one. So she's picking up the place. I said, give that over to me, man. I'll finish that. <laughs> but, but then I realized he touched it to cut it. I said, I ain't going there. Now take it away. Take it away. I'm not touching it. Okay. I go, what man? I, and I joked with him. I go, what man doesn't finish his cheeseburger? <laughs> he says, a man that wants to stay healthy. <laughs> Touche. He said, I learned something. I think a lot of people are doing this today. That if you only eat half your food, right, you order and you only eat half your food, that, you know, it's better for your health. I'm sorry, I was raised, my mom said, you eat all your food because they're starving kids in Africa. <laughs> I don't know how that related to me eating all my food. But it's like, whatever you put before me, if it's good, I'm going to eat it. Matter of fact, my meal was so good, I got the bread that was remaining, like, very <laughs> professionally uh, with great couth and manners, scraped the plate, and then used the fork and ate it. My plate looked like it was, they didn't even need to wash it. <laughs> Only eating half your meal for health reasons, and you do that consistently with intensity? <laughs> That's why he looked in such good shape. That takes commitment. Where in your life might commitment begin to serve you better? Where have you maybe waned in your commitments? You know, coming to church consistently and being committed to that with intensity to worship and pray and seek the Lord, that's only going to benefit you over a long period of time. It's what you do because habit determines destiny. Habit determines fate. Habit determines outcome. So where in your life might intensity begin to show up in a bigger way or consistency or commitment? And where in our lives are we only enjoying a partial victory when God wants us to have the complete victory? Sometimes we think, well, it's up to God. If it's God's will. No, it's the bow and the arrow, it's in your hands. The arrows, they're in your You. God's not going to strike the arrows for you. You need to strike them. The arrow of intensity, the arrow of consistency, and the arrow of commitment. And really this message is for all of us because all of us have areas in our life that I like to call growth opportunities, Right? Not so much your weaknesses or your sins, but just growth opportunities. Areas where you could grow for God's glory because you're motivated by your love for him and his love for you. And all it takes is a higher level of intensity, some more consistency, and full-on commitment. And sometimes you have to start small. Maybe you're battling nicotine. Maybe you're smoking a pack of cigarettes a day, right? This is not a matter of whether that's sin or not. It's just not good for you. Like Paul said, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. So you're not going to, now God can supernaturally set you free. You can go completely cold turkey. But maybe it's just cutting down to half a pack a day and then down to two cigarettes a day and then down to one. In other words, start small. If you try to bite off more than you could chew, you're going you're gonna to just get disillusioned. You're going to discourage yourself. If you want to start an exercise program, I'm going to go five days a week. No, you're not. No, you're not. I promise you, you're not. I'll prove it, please. And then I'll be your fan. I'll be your biggest fan. But you're probably not. I'm going to go one day a week. That you can do. For 30 minutes, that you could do. Just start there. One day a week for 30 minutes. Imagine, you say, that's easy. That's, that's too easy. No, just start there. And then you can increase it to two days a week, an hour a week, right? Start small and then go big. Habit determines fate. Habit determines destiny. It's what you do with intensity, consistently, in a committed way over an extended period of time that produces the results we want and need so desperately. 
in our lives. All right, every head bowed, every eye closed. Father, we humbly come before you today, and we just thank you for this message and what the Holy Spirit is saying to us through this message. May we have ears to hear and a heart to receive that message. May all of us be challenged, and may all of us be challenged to do something, not to simply be hearers, but doers of the word. So, Lord, what are you saying to me personally in this message? Thank you. It's not, it's not through condemnation or shame or guilt. That's, that's not how the Holy Spirit works. There may be some conviction there, but that's a good thing. But it's the love of Christ that constrains us, that pushes us, that propels us, that motivates us. Knowing that you love us unconditionally, that we love you, that we want to be the best version of ourselves moving forward. So thank you for this message. Thank you for the voice of the Holy Spirit through the voice of Elisha telling us, take the arrows and strike the ground. Now with heads bowed and eyes closed, if you're here today and you don't know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, or you need to rededicate your life to Christ, I'm going to lead you in a prayer, and the rest of the congregation is going to pray this prayer with you. If you want to surrender your life to Christ or rededicate your life to Christ, it's so important that you say this prayer with your own mouth and mean it from your own heart. It's a prayer of repentance, a prayer of placing your faith in the eternal God and receiving the gift of eternal life through his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Here we go. Dear God in heaven, I know I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. There's only one Savior. His name is Jesus. I call upon you, Jesus. I ask you now, come into my heart. Come into my life. Be my Lord and be my Savior. I turn from sin to the true and living God. I receive his love, his grace, and his forgiveness. Dear God in heaven, you're now my father, and I am your child. Fill me now with your Holy Spirit and give me strength to live for you and serve you all the days of my life, beginning today for the rest of eternity. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's thank the Lord together, church family. God bless you. We love you.